Hear the words from the second chapter of Genesis, beginning at verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Many of you know that over the past two years, I have been enrolled in the Creating Culture of Renewal course at the invitation of our district superintendent. The core concept of the course is to move congregations from discipleship to apostleship. The more time I've spent with this material, the clearer it has become to me that moving from discipleship to apostleship doesn't happen without a compelling mission and vision. Our denominational mission for the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I have loved that mission statement because it says that we as United Methodists aren't just making disciples for the sake of making disciples. We make disciples to transform the world, to make a difference. The problem I've come to realize as we endeavor to live out our denominational mission is that rarely do we see apostles or disciples transforming the world around them. The few times that we see disciples having a transformational effect on the world is when Jesus sent them out to act as apostles rather than disciples. For so long, I have understood that a disciple is a student learning to emulate their teacher in every aspect of life, while an apostle is one who is sent by God as an ambassador to those who don't know God. The problem with that understanding of an apostle is that most people never feel sent by God as an ambassador to non-believers. And because we don't feel sent, we feel like we're off the hook. That's exactly what I see when I read the scriptures. Over and over, God endeavored to teach his people how to represent him in the world in order that their example might impact the people in the world around them and lead others into a relationship with God. The mission was to reflect God and represent God in daily life so blatantly that those who were not God followers would see the difference in these folks and they would desire what those who followed God demonstrated. Reading through the Old Testament, that approach brought varying levels of success. Those who experienced a direct calling from God to represent him were much more effective than those who were not. Let's face it, there was no spread of belief in God like we experienced with COVID-19 in that if you got near someone who believed in God, you would be infected with their belief. And that continues to be true today. In the New Testament, beginning with the four Gospels, we see God employing a new tactic. God came to live among the people in the form of Jesus of Nazareth. 
He came to demonstrate and to teach what it looked like to follow God in a life-transforming way. He began his mission by calling together 12 unlikely men into a community. Community is defined as a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. It's a particular area or place considered together with its inhabitants. It's a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. It's true some of the men Jesus called came from the same community of Northern Galilee. Many of them were also a part of the community of fishermen in Northern Galilee. Some came from other regions of Israel and had little or nothing in common with the others in this community. The community Jesus created wasn't so much a community of people who lived in the same place. Instead, it was a community born out of a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. The fellowship developed as they endeavored to become disciples of Jesus Christ. The fact that the first thing Jesus did was to form a community where common attitudes, interests, and goals could be developed shouldn't surprise us. Remember, Jesus is God incarnate. He was present at creation. He was there when the events of today's text took place. Our text for today tells us that in the course of creation, God created a man. He named him Adam, and after creating Adam, he realized that Adam needed a companion, so he created the animals of the world and sent them to Adam. He named each one, but none of them fulfilled the need of companionship. Realizing the need was still there, God created another human, Eve, who immediately fulfilled Adam's need of a companion. This particular telling of the creation story makes it clear that God created us with a need for one another. He never intended that we live in isolation from one another. Relationship and fellowship with others would be key to healthy living. When Diana and I first came to John Wesley Church, we were struck by the sense of community and the strong relationship vibe in this church. It felt a lot like our experience in the little country church we served where so many were related and most had grown up together as classmates in school. Many of the relationships were familial, but not all. The fellowship that took place whenever they gathered was natural. It was born out of generations of being together. They were a friendly church, at least to one another. But when visitors showed up, it was obvious that they were outsiders and those visitors knew it. That was the difference we experienced here at John Wesley. Visitors were often greeted warmly and made to feel welcome. In fact, whenever I conduct new member gatherings and have asked folks why they continued at our church, the answer has nearly always been the same. The warmth of this congregation toward them, the friendliness of this congregation toward them. It's as if we have learned the truth that we were created with a need for one another, that we were created with a need for companionship and fellowship. But I believe we've also learned another important lesson found in scripture, that we are better together than we are alone. That was the clear message of Solomon in Ecclesiastes 9, 4, 9 through 12. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But if someone who falls alone is in real trouble, likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Since the beginning of creation, God has known that we will be best when we are in relationship, in fellowship, in community with one another. When I was introduced to the Staff Parish Relations Committee of this church eight years ago, yes, it's been eight years, 
I was amazed to hear the story of how this church came into existence. I heard about a community of people living in the area who had developed significant relationships and desired to form a church together. That desire resulted in the establishment of the congregation. Right before I came to serve as your pastor, another United Methodist Church in the area, the Dunlap United Methodist Church, found that their numbers had dwindled over the years and they could no longer support their existence as a church. Knowing that they had no choice but to close their doors, they were determined to find a church where they could connect and live out their mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I'm told that after visiting a number of churches nearby, they chose to become a part of our church community because of the warmth and the welcome they experienced here. Because of the fellowship, the deep relationships, the community that is experienced here, we have seen families move away from the neighborhood and continue to drive significant distances to remain part of our congregation. In fact, probably half of our congregation drive in from outside of the neighborhood where our church is located. And much of that willingness to drive is due to the relationships and community that they have experienced in this congregation. As our members have moved out of the area, new families have moved in. The neighborhood around our church is becoming more and more diverse in its ethnic makeup. What was once a vibrant community of close-knit neighbors has become more disconnected. What once was a community defined by a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals has become a community defined by a group of people living in the same place, a particular area or place considered together with its inhabitants. Beginning this fall, my work with creating a culture of renewal will focus on moving from mission to vision. Vision is what it looks like to live out the mission, and it's different in every context. Our mission is that of the United Methodist Church, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Years ago, a team was gathered to discern the vision for John Wesley Church, tasked with describing what it would look like to live out our mission in our community. The vision coming out of that team's work is this. We as individuals and as a congregation empowered by the Spirit strive to serve God by walking with Christ to reach the individual, touch the community, and serve the world. Over the years, that statement has often been abbreviated to empowered to reach, touch, and serve. The challenge of creating a culture of renewal is to develop a vision that is not a congregational improvement plan, but a vision that will have a kingdom of God impact on the community around us. For the past nine months, I've gathered some folks familiar with what I've been doing in my coursework over the past two years and a few who were not as involved to be a team who would open themselves up to dream God's dreams for our church. We have spent hours in prayer, discernment, sharing ideas and sharing in challenging conversation. What we've determined is that the vision we have been operating out of for years is God's dream for our church. That being said, for whatever reason, it has not become a driving, guiding vision for our church. That's where our focus will turn as we move into the fall months. How can we allow our vision to guide us forward as we endeavor to live out our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world by being empowered to reach, touch, and serve? My strong conviction is that it will involve community, and relationships because that is what God has kept alive and magnified within this congregation. That has led me to this series that will wrap up our summer and launch us into the exciting possibilities of the fall. The series I'm calling Created for Community and it will look at the importance and impact of community throughout the Bible and how that plays into the move from discipleship to apostleship. I hope that you will be with us each week 
as we explore the critical aspects of community in fulfilling both our mission and our vision. Let's pray. Holy God, we want nothing more than to fulfill the mission that you have given us. That mission is clear. It's stated in the Great Commission that we are to go into the world and make disciples. Our denomination has taken that and, and put that in language that hopefully makes more sense to us today that we are to be making disciples that will transform the world that we live in. We have envisioned what that might look like for us to be doing that. And we know that, that it means that we have got to reach individuals around us, that, that we have got to learn how to in significant ways touch the community where we are. And, and we need to learn to serve the world around us. So Lord, as we move through these next weeks and months together, uh, help us to have open hearts and open minds and open ears to hear what you might be dreaming for us as we endeavor to fulfill the mission that you have extended to us, that you've called us to. Lord, I pray that you will begin to speak to our spirits and that you will create within us an excitement of what can be and what will be if we will but make ourselves available to you. Knowing, Lord, that if we make ourselves available, you'll make us able. Lord, lead us and guide us as we move forward, empowered to reach, touch, and serve in order to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I pray it will be so in Jesus' name. Amen.
I send you out of this time of worship to be the people of God and the church of Jesus Christ you were created and called to be. Disciple makers, world changers, transformers of that which is around you for the glory of God. I pray that you will do that through every aspect of your living and your being and your doing. In Jesus' name, amen.